I'm going to invite Bishop Frank Abedi Buatin again. He's no stranger to us. It was only in April that he came and ministered a couple of times here. And um, next week, um, my friend who is his bishop I will also be here, God willing, first time he's going to be in this building. This is Bishop Adijanfi who works, uh, Bishop Abedi works with so well. And um, he's becoming part of this church. As you know, just as I become part of ICC, when I go there, they work me hard. So when they come here, I want to work them hard as well. So we with delight and excitement welcome Bishop. Thank you. Bless Thank you, you, bro. Thank you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Wonderful. Uh, my bishop, uh, thank you for trusting me with this pulpit. And uh, I also thank God for the life of each and every member of this great church. Amen. 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 Yeah, it's one of the nicest church. And you have one of the choicest servants of God in the person of uh, Bishop Cornelius. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. Good. Shall we pray? God, we give you praise and we give you all the glory. Amen. We acknowledge your goodness and your mercy. For we stand and we sit, we express ourselves knowing that all that we can do are all product of your grace and of your mercy. Amen. For that we say we are grateful for showing us kindness and showing us mercy. Thank you even for the sense of coming to church, into this fellowship. It's a gathering unto your power, and gathering unto your grace and unto your mercy. We therefore ask that God, even as we stand preaching, as we sit hearing, we are asking that the Spirit of God will lord it over us, O God. Help us communicate and help us hear your word. We shall not be the same. We will be transformed. We will obey your word. We will walk in the light of your word. We thank you for the supply of the Holy Spirit, O God. In Jesus' name mighty name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Wonderful. I want to do what I've captioned, the great commitment to the great commission. I'm taking my scriptures from Mark chapter 16. Can we start reading it? Mark chapter 16 uh, from the verse 9. <clears throat> right. Now, this is a summary of the Apostle Mac uh, uh, of, the, of the resurrection as we know it. You know, we start from the verse 1, he speak about some certain personalities, but let me read it from the verse 9. <clears throat> now, when he rose early on the first day of the week, that was Sunday morning, he appeared first to Mary Madeline, out of whom he had cast seven demons. So she went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. <coughs> and when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. After that, he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country. And uh, they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Later, he appeared to the eleven as they sat at table, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. 
In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it will it by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. So then, after the Lord has spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere. Somebody say they went out and preached everywhere. It means they obeyed, right? They went out and preached everywhere. The Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Hallelujah. Wonderful. I want us first to see the great commission or this important commandment from the perspective of the apostles, you know. Remember, you know, their dreams were shattered after Jesus Christ died. They saw, they have followed Jesus for some years and knowing that Jesus is invincible. So suddenly, you know, they were able to get Jesus, kill him, you know. But thank God, although they were there hiding somewhere, their dreams were shattered, they became disappointed, disillusioned. They didn't know what to do because as at that time, they really did not understand and they really did not believe that Jesus Christ will rise again. And lo and behold, the third day, the Bible said that Mary Madeline, which of course you know her history, he is a prostitute turned a saint. Hallelujah. Amen. Bible said that he, she, and Mary, the mother of James. If the mother of James, then definitely he was the mother of Jesus Christ. James was a half-brother of Jesus. So Mary Madeline, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and then Salome, who was the wife of Zebedee, also had two children who confronted Jesus Christ to seek for, you know, position in the kingdom. This Salome also is a sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus. So these three people decided to go and anoint Jesus Christ at the tomb. And then, lo and behold, the Bible said that they saw different things. They were overwhelmed. They were very, very much filled with fear and surprise. And at the same time, excitement. You know, I don't know the combination of fear, excitement, the description we can give it. But that is at least the kind of condition that they found themselves. And the Bible says that they fled to report to Jesus. And when the Bible says they fled, you know what it means. It means they really ran with fear and excitement. Excitement, you know, not really understanding what has happened, but at least they have received a message from an angel telling them that you are seeking the living among the dead. Go tell the disciple because Jesus Christ appeared to them that, hey, I am alive. So go tell the disciples and Peter that they should go and wait for me at Galilee. Hallelujah. And the Bible said that he also appeared to two people who were also on their way to the countryside. And then they also went back to the disciples to confirm that indeed what these ladies are saying is real. I have, we have also seen him. Praise the name of God. Still in doubt, not really sure of what this testimony is. And then the Bible says that right there to the 11, Jesus appeared to them. Hallelujah. And this appearance continued for almost about 40 days. Jesus appearing here and there. The intention is to establish the fact without doubt that look here, this is the person you saw crucified and died. I am alive. And he even demonstrated that look here, I am not a ghost. A ghost doesn't have, you know, bone and flesh. I am the real Jesus you saw. I am alive today. But go and preach the gospel. Other, trans, other versions say that go and make disciples of all nations. And whoever believes what you say 
will be saved or will receive eternal life. At the same time, when they were grappling with the resurrection and trying to establish their heart that the victory has been won and that our Jesus is alive again, the Bible also says that the soldiers who were there and witnessed the resurrection of Jesus also went to the high priest and reported the incident to them. And they were hushed to sit down. And the Bible said that they were giving huge money to set up a propaganda machinery. Go tell the well that when you slept, the disciples came and they took their body away. Hallelujah. Amen. Don't forget. That they were told that, look here, when you go out there with this propaganda and you ask, you have a case, I we will defend you with a governor. So, the disciples, those who heard the gospel and they were to obey, you need to appreciate that they were opposed, they were faced with a formidable opposition who not only have a governmental authority, they also have money. Praise the name of God. And so it's like, do we have to obey? But you also need to appreciate that the great commission, the great commandment is coming from a person with what I describe as superior status, you know, sitting at the right hand of God. When we say somebody is sitting at the right hand of God, it means that all authority, because all authority in the universe reside at this position of the right hand of God. So this commandment is coming from Jesus, who has all power. He told them, all authority in heaven and on earth have been given unto me. And I'm telling you, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Hallelujah. Amen. Are you hearing me? Yes, I don't know whether you can identify with the disciples and know how important obeying the scripture is. And I don't know whether you can see them understanding or appreciating the kind of authority that is behind them. And so they were eager because standing before you and telling you to do this is somebody who has conquered death. He died and he rose again. We have seen him alive. I don't know whether, you know, you will dare disobey him. Or there will be an element of fear. Of course, as human beings, naturally, when you hear threatening coming from this authority who captured Jesus and killed him, there could be an element of fear. However, they were eager to go. And so Jesus said, you just wait. I know how, how passionate you are to go. Wait until you are endowed with power from on high. And so the Bible said that they waited. Then that day, we describe as the day of Pentecost. The Bible said that the Spirit came upon them as a mighty rushing wind. And the Bible said they were filled with power. They were emboldened. And for the first time, Peter stood up and preached the gospel with a piercing, you know, kind of force. And the Bible said that their heart was pricked. He stepped. And even charged them and told them, this same Jesus that you crucified, he is alive. For it was not possible that death will hold him. Hallelujah. And here they stand, knowing and experiencing the resurrection. Coming to a point to know without a shadow of doubt that Jesus is alive. I don't know whether they, have, they can lie. They cannot lie. They have seen him. And for 40 days, they know that this Jesus is alive. There is no way they can lie. So they were prepared rather to die than to just give up and speak lies. So they preach with all boldness and prevail upon them. And for the first time, I would say 3,000 people were added to the church. And the movement that they called Jesus people started. That time they were not, didn't have the title Christians. They were just movement and 
People became confused. People became alarmed. People became threatened. They feel that this Jesus, you know, is threatening our position. And they were doing everything and started persecuting them. Then came this man I describe as the secretary general of the opposition. And that is Saul who turned into Paul. And on his way to Damascus to continue his persecution, he was struck down. And the Bible said that he came out confessing, Lord, who are you? And then he was also changed. And this is what, it's, what he said. When we read first no, Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1, verse 14. Can you put it there for me? He said, I am a debtor. Amen. Amen. He didn't go and borrow any money. But that is the kind of description, the kind of passion, the kind of responsibility that came upon him when he became born again. He said, I'm a debtor. I've seen it. Both to the Greeks and to barbarians. Both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. Give me the 16. Are you there? Yes. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Hallelujah. Amen. And why should he even think of being ashamed of the gospel? Of course, you need to understand the cultural element in this whole uh, pericope. The point is that that time, Greeks, Romans, they were wise people at that time. So for you to come tell them that this Jesus who was crucified, who was killed between two criminals to be a savior, what do you mean? What are you talking about? So the Bible said that for the Jews who couldn't understand the scriptures and couldn't see the messiahship in Jesus Christ. Bible said that for them to pray to them is a stumbling block. They were not prepared for it. And then the Greek are looking for signs and wonders uh, to prove that this Jesus is really a messiah. Because they couldn't really identify how can this guy be a savior. But Paul said, uh, look here, it is foolishness unto them and to the Jews it is a stumbling block but to you who believe it is the power of God unto salvation so I'm not ashamed to just come to you at Rome with the gospel for I've come to realize it is the power of God unto salvation the first time you know I really experienced and saw by experience the power of the gospel to transform is when I was sent to Pando, you know, by my institution that time, after we have conducted a crusade to just continue to just establish the church there many years ago. And I will never forget. So that time I was very young, you know, I could pray for hours. And when I finish praying, you know, and I stand, my eyes are red, and I am prepared to attack anybody with the gospel. So I went to town to just preach, and then I came across this woman. In fact, at the first time looking at the woman, I realized that the woman would be in, his, in her late 50s. And so uh, all that I saw was that this woman was depressed, you know. She was sad. Anything unattractive, you know, was upon her life, and uh, I, I even suspected that he was even contemplating suicide and, you know, harming herself because you realize there is no hope in her. There is nothing attractive. There is nothing inspiring about her life. And so I started the gospel. I was very passionate that time. You know, I preached the gospel. Whatever I know that Jesus can do for her, I was prepared and I said it. In the middle of it, the sister started crying. And you know, when you are preaching the gospel and somebody starts to cry in response to that, it means that you have really achieved what you really want to achieve. She will be prepared to accept Jesus. And so I stopped and led her to invite Christ into her life. And then I prayed for her. 
And I left her and told her that tomorrow I'm expecting you in church. And then, so on Sunday, we started church and, you know, praise and worship time. Everybody was dancing. You know, in Ghana, we dance all kinds of dance, you know, right here. You see everybody doing his or her own thing. Everything goes. When you stand here and you want to express your gratitude to God, you do anything, anyhow. So the sister joined and he was expressing herself and then, you know, she was new. So people didn't know why you want to take everything, you want to take the floor and it appears as if we should leave you alone and for you to dance and praise God. So even when we finished the praise and worship and then, you know, the sister was still there. You know, not prepared to go anywhere. And so the ushers have to restrain her. So when the ushers touch her, you know, she turned to me and I said, but I don't know you. And she said, Pastor, don't you remember me? I have to go back and look at her one more time. And he said, I am the sister you pray to yesterday at the corner there. So quickly I asked, how old are you? And she said she's 24 years. And that was the first time I realized that in 24 hours, the gospel can transform somebody and affect even her physical appearance. That is when I realized that the gospel has a power to transform people. Let me tell you, when you see it here, yeah, I'm, I'm nice. I'm nice. When you look at us like this, let me tell you, you have no idea where we are coming from. You have no idea what was going on in our life. You have no idea. And if you be able to play back and see what we were doing, who we were, how my mom rejected a very good and beautiful, handsome son, and a lot of people, we didn't matter. But now, but now, when they are having a meeting and we are not there, they, they can't go. They can't do it. They have come to acknowledge, I'm the ninth born. You know, we have this big family. I'm the ninth born. When we are having a family meeting, I need to be there. If I'm not there, they cannot continue. They can't. It is all about what the gospel has done. The power of God to transform people. Hallelujah. Amen. And that is the reason why you need to preach the gospel. That is the reason why you have to do whatever you can. So Apostle Paul said, as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to those who are in Rome also. Why? Because therein, he says, is the righteousness of God revealed. From faith to faith. You only need people to believe and to call upon Jesus Christ. Church, I've come to tell you that Ellen Pentecostal Church must be doubled. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And I'm here to just share a few things that have to compel you to contribute to the growth of this church. There are few things that I want to share with you. The first one is what I call attraction model. What model? Good. When I say attraction model, it is all about, you know, when somebody is passing this building, it's beautiful, okay? So he or she can be attracted to come around. Mm -hmm. Somebody can invite somebody, okay, without even preaching so much to him. You will just throw an invitation for the person to come. You know why? Because there are a lot of good things happening here. You know you have a good pastor. You know that he preaches a good word. You know that you have a good choir. 
You know that a lot of good things are here. You have a good sitting. You have everything in this room is good. You have a good presence of God. Anyway, you know, look at the kind of joy. What I call dancing with a jubilant heart. Look at the people that came here. You know, these are good things the whole of London need to experience on Sunday morning. Amen. Don't you see that way? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. That is the reason why you need to invite somebody. In fact, you have to be proud of Ellen Pentecostal. Yes. Croydon Branch. You have to be passionate and very, very, very have a high opinion about your pastor and talk about your pastor. Tell them, go, come and hear my pastor. Yes. If you can so much uh, preach to the person, just invite them. So in the attraction model, it is all about invitation. Do whatever you can. Knock at doors. Throw invitation to them. Let them come and just see. Tell them, come and see. And I want to assure you, whoever you invite, you, he will not be disappointed for inviting him. As a matter of fact, the person will thank you for inviting him to come to the church. Amen. Amen. You don't know what is going on when we are in church like this. A lot of things, angels of God are present with us. How many of you know that? The Bible talk about coming onto the, uh, the general assembly. Coming onto the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus. That's a better thing than that of Abel. Let me tell you, in the spirit world, you have no idea what is happening when we sit like this. Your eyes can see. But let me tell you, according to the scripture, that we are not alone here. Right within us is the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus. That is the reason why I'm telling you, invite the drunk, invite the drunkard, invite whoever he is. Just let the person come. In any way, let me tell you, this church is like a hospital. It's like what? Everybody is not well. Oh. Are you hearing me? We are not angels sitting down here. We have all come and we are being repaired. We are being transformed. We are born again all right. But let me tell you, everybody at the sound of my voice, you are saved by grace. Amen. What did I say? Let me tell you, Christianity, for you to become a Christian, there is a zero work. For you to become a righteous, there is a zero work. For you to be a sinner, there is a zero work. Is it not written? That through one man, sin and death pass unto all men. Is it not also written that through one man, righteousness and life eternal pass on? That whoever believes in him will be saved and have eternal life. Amen. Let me tell you, let them come. We were like them. It's just like when you are in, in Ghana, when you are going to a cemetery, call a Wudumi cemetery, you know, there is a signboard that will tell you, all of us here, we were like you. <laughs> Are you hearing me? Yeah. So it is, let me tell you, we were like them. So do whatever you can to invite somebody. For you not to invite somebody to church is a tragedy. It means you don't believe in the church. It means you don't appreciate your pastor. It means you don't really appreciate the singing and all that goes on here. But I'm telling you, this is one of the amazing church that are fellowship. And you might be proud of it. So it shouldn't be difficult for you to invite somebody. Oh, you are saying that, Pastor, when I invite them, they won't come. If you go and you fail, try again. Because you know that you are doing a good thing and that they will be blessed and that when they come, they will not be disappointed. So they will relent in doing that. So that is attraction model. Then we have incarnational model. You have what? When I say incarnation, you know, the way incarnation is, you know, God becoming flesh or the word becoming flesh. 
So when I say incarnational model, that is when we come to your life. That is when we come to a point to express the word in our, with our life. Without even speaking. Somebody has to be able to point to you and say, you are a Christian with your life. Because the world out there knows Christianity. They know who a Christian is. So your community, your apartment, you have to be able to demonstrate a kind of life that people can point to you and say you are a Christian. It is by doing good. Christians, we do good, isn't it? By showing kindness, by showing mercy, doing what you know is good, living the Christian life, living the word, letting the word become in flesh in your life. So much so that if they don't, you don't even speak, they will say, this is a Christian. Your colleague, your workplace, your friends, you have to be able to demonstrate a Christian life for them to appreciate Christianity so that next time when you say, let us go to the concert, they will follow you. And when they follow you, they will be saved and they will become born again. Are you hearing me? We must do something because this is a good church. I'm so passionate about it. You need to invite people. Let them know. Live your life. Let them see Christ in you. Bible says that you are the light of the world. Let them see the light in you and come to your light. Bible says we are the salt of the world. Let them see the salt and their life become seasoned with the salt. We cannot live like that. Church, I want you to also understand something. That the litmus test of your maturity as a Christian is not how many years you have spent in this church or in Christianity. The litmus test is you being able to bear fruit. Not only the fruit or the gift of the Spirit or the fruit of the Spirit, but I'm talking about being able to say that this is a person, this is my son, this is my daughter in Christ. This is somebody that God used me to bring to church and become established. That is a mark, that is a little test of your maturity as a Christian. And you need to prove it. We don't come only to clap our hands and to go. You don't only have to pride yourself and say, I've been in LA for many years, 20 years, 30 years, or 10 years, or whatever. That is not what is important. How many so, if you decide, say, one year, or let me say, oh, I think it will be too much. Uh, two months, you decide. You plan about it. You pray about it. And show to yourself, this two months or this quarter of the year, I'll bring one soul. Turn to your neighbor and say, one. And granny say, Eko me. Bako. Numero on. I don't know how we say it in Mali or we say it in Iran or you, I don't know. But I still want to emphasize that only one. Within two months, you plan about why? Because it is important. You know that you're going to be rewarded, church. Look at heaven, we're not going to be the same. We will be rewarded. There is a reward when we go to heaven. Some are dying and preaching the gospel. Some hands are being chopped off. But you are here enjoying your tea, enjoying your rice, enjoying your... I don't know here, I don't know the food you like best, but uh, chicken and chips and, and all. And you are living life, Christian life, free. But some people are dying. Some are going through hell. Some are going through torture for being Christians and they are still pressing on. It's just like the disciples. When they decided that they are going to preach about the resurrection, they did that and someone was caught and his head was chopped off. That is James. He didn't scare them because they cannot deny that Jesus is alive and that Jesus can help people. Church, just overcome your circumstance 
plan about it, and you have to be intentional about this thing. Okay? You have to be intentional about it and live the Christian life. Then the last one is missional model. This is where you don't only invite. This is where people don't have to be attracted. This is when you as a church will go into the world and invade the world with the gospel. And that is the great commission. And that is the heart of my message. When Jesus said, go into the world and preach the gospel. Tell them all is said. Tell them sins have been forgiven. It has been paid for. Everybody in this world is legally saved. Don't misunderstand me. Hallelujah. Everybody in this world, from North Pole to South Pole, from Cairo to Cape Town, everybody is legally saved. You are here enjoying it because vital, you have had a vital experience by just believing because the Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It is for the whole world. But you, vitally, have had an experience by believing in the Lord Jesus. Let me tell you, people out there need to believe and also to come to the saving knowledge of Christ Jesus. So that is what I describe as a you know, Roman rule. But before that, understand the most effective means of sharing the gospel is first, establish relationship. If you want to share the gospel to anybody, you need to have a relationship with the person. In fact, that is the most effective means of communicating the gospel. So right there, in your neighborhood, in your community, your next door neighbor, you have to find means of establishing relationship with the person. When you sit in the train, when you sit in the bus, just strike an acquaintance with somebody and look for means of injecting the gospel in it. And for you to be able to do it effectively, because people don't have time. Three minutes at the bus stop, three minutes or five minutes in the train or in the bus. So there is what is known as focus testimony. What testimony? Focus testimony. There are three paragraphs. First paragraph, talk about the way you were before you became born again. Everybody have it. When I stand here and I'm preaching as if I'm coming from heaven, no. I have a past, and my past is so dark, it's so rotten, and everybody sitting down there as an angel, you have it. You have it. You, you know what you were doing before you became born again. You were good for nothing. In fact, you were a bad person. You were. And everybody have it. So that is the first paragraph of the testimony. Then the next one is... Your encounter with God. Everybody know how he became born again. Did somebody invite you to church? Did you pick a track? Did you listen to a television message? But the bottom line is that you believe in the Lord Jesus at a certain point in the, your, his, your history. You believe. And you became born again. And when you became born again, what has happened? That is the last paragraph. The difference. Here we stand. We are so happy. We know we are a better person before we became born again. So this is a focal testimony that you need to share. And sometimes, like I said, they don't have time. Three minutes. And this is something, sometimes you will even have to write it. I tell students that write it. Write it as an essay. Three paragraphs that you can read, you can share in three minutes. At the bus stop, in train station, whatever. You know, salvation is, 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 is a process. So don't think that when you say it and you don't succeed in getting the person, receive Jesus, you are failed. No, you just leave the person. And this is where you are not aware the power of the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit can do when you leave the person to accept Jesus. Let me tell you, sometimes this message that you were saying and even your image can stay with the person so much that a person has to be put to the wall to accept the message that you were trying to share. God knows how to organize people to accept Jesus as their Lord and personal Savior. Jesus is the 
Holy Spirit is the change agent. You are only a flesh. Give him the flesh. Give him the mouth. Give him the legs. Give him the eyes. Give him the voice. And I'm telling you, he's going to do the rest. Amen. Hallelujah. Let me quickly run through what I call Roman road. Because sometimes you don't know what to say. You know, what am I, what am I going to say? Should I go and tell the person about prosperity and all those? No. Let me simply tell you. The Roman road. There are certain scriptures, you don't need to even capture them in your memory. You only need to understand the words. Romans 3.23, everybody knows. What is there? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every human being needs to understand his sin nature. Everybody needs to know that the whole way, every time they can hurry, hurry, we are sinners, including you. And don't go and talk about, you know, as if you are holier than that kind of attitude. No, that's not what I'm talking about. You need to understand, sitting down there, you are a sinner saved by grace. Everybody in this world, we are sinners. We are saved by grace. Like I said, when you stand as a Christian, righteousness is a gift. Holiness is a gift. All those things that we can boast of, they are all gifts in the person of Jesus Christ. So all is required of you to let the person know that he is a sinner. And we are all in the same category. Then, Romans 5.18, you don't leave the person there, guilty. Because when you are under the influence of the Holy Spirit and you start talking like this, you know the person will come to a point to feel so guilty. That is the reason why some of them will have to cry. But you don't leave the person there. Verse 8 of Romans 5 says that, But God demonstrates his own love toward us. In the world we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You let the person know that it's not a hopeless situation. Jesus has paid for your sins. Let a person know that Jesus has paid for your sin. You need not to stay in that sinful nature. Although you are a sinner, but thankfully, when God demonstrated his own love toward us, in the, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let's go to 623, which is also another very popular verse. Let's capture these verses. He said, for the wages of sin is death, because here you have to be stronger. That he cannot reject it. He cannot just, uh, just take, take it for granted. You tell the person, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. In Christ Jesus our Lord. You push that also. Now look here. There is a way out. You cannot stay in that sin. And die the second death. But you can also change that situation by believing the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says you will receive eternal life. Let's go to chapter 10, verse 9. Chapter 10, verse 9. He said that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen. It's so simple. So in all this thing, you are just trying to help the person to come to this point. Go to the verse 10. Verse 10 says that for with the heart, one believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Go to 13. 13. He said that for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do you believe this? Amen. So all that is required of you is to bring a person to a point to call upon the name of Jesus. Amen. Whether he's a drunkard, whether he's a drug addict, whoever he is, from the headmaster to pantry boy, everybody, <laughs> everybody, I'm talking like a student, yeah. everybody, Whoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Saving the person is not your responsibility. 
Your responsibility is compelling somebody to call upon the name of Jesus. Bible says the name of Jesus is a strong tower. It is the only name under the heavens that men can be saved. Let me tell you, we have believed certain things, you know, when we, you know, when we started Christianity and, you know, we preach holiness. We believe that you have to live right. But here I'm talking about being born again, becoming a child of God. Let me tell you, the only thing that you need to do is to call upon Jesus Christ. When you are able to get somebody to call upon Jesus, the person becomes saved. He becomes a child of God. He made God to be true because God has given a testimony. God has a record that he has given eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whosoever have the son has life. Whoever does not have the son does not have life. He said, I wrote this to you that you may know that you have eternal life. Those who believe in the name of the son of God. It's very simple. The rest is up to God. For the person to grow, it's up to God to just organize the person. But your responsibility is to help the person be called upon the name of the Lord. And you need to do it. You need to just attract them, invite them. You need to showcase your life so that people will know that you belong to Christ. And let me tell you, when you do that, God will bless you. That is witnessing. That is witnessing. And like I said in the one, when we say witness, it, from the Hebrew perspective, when we say witness, you know, those times, it's an old cultural values, you know. When somebody say, they didn't have a word that says, I thank you. Hmm? I thank you. There is no phrase like that in the Hebrew language. So when you give a set, when you give some pounds to somebody, when you, you, you do good to somebody, the only thing you, the person will say is that, I will tell your name to others. I will tell your name to others. And this is where we got the word witness. And let me tell you, the highest compliment that we can give to God is to share the gospel. That is the highest compliment. As a man of it is not coming here to give money. It's not coming here to praise God. It's not coming here to do, you know. But if you are able to share the gospel, somebody out there in the dark, somebody out there depressed, you don't know what is happening in some people's apartment. They are there alone. They are there. The atmosphere they find themselves is so heavy, you know, so depressed. Look here, look at the expression that we have put out when we came here. So nice. Don't you think that the whole of London have to be here? Yes. They have to be here. Amen. And I think you have to do something about it. I'm passionately asking you, invite people to church. And I believe God will bless you yes. for doing that. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Shall we pray? They were able to do it and bold to do it. By the power of the Holy Spirit. Holy Father, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Here we stand. We have experienced so much good. We have experienced your mercy. Is it not your power that have kept us? Is it not because the angels of God are man and encamping around us? Have we not survived till this time because of your grace and your mercy? God, help us share this. Help us share the gospel, preach the gospel. God, stir us in our heart and help us invite people to church. You have blessed us as church members. God, you want people to, you want us to share this blessing with people. Help us, therefore, to invite people and to let people know what you are doing here. Thank you for answered prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. In their church, whenever I go there and I preach, they go, what a word. And they say, what a preacher. So I'm going to say, what a word. And then you say, what a preacher. What a word. 
<laughs> Hallelujah. Can I say that those of you that frequent uh, Ghana and Accra and all that, when you go to Ghana, look for ICC International. Okay? They have branches uh, there. And so a number of you are visiting, not only the Ghanaians, I think this week or next week, some a team is going to Ghana from other churches, some from here. And when you go, go and see what they are doing in, um, in, in their headquarters in Accra where they get me to preach. And not only have I preached at their, I've even preached at their youth, their national youth camp. Amazing. Having about 164 young people in a camp somewhere. They are doing a great job there. And we support them just as they support us. May the Lord bless you, Bishop. A timely word. Uh, this year, I mentioned that we're going to make Christ known. And I pray that you and I will play our role. That next week, you will come with someone. Someone say amen. amen. Pray for someone. And just be intentional in inviting them to church and to Christ. Someone say amen. amen. Uh, when, I, when I heard the story of in the 9 a.m. service, it talks about the lady that looked over 50, and yet 24 hours later, she looked about half of that age. That remind, sorry? <laughs> uh, uh, that reminded me of a story that happened in Kensington Temple, one of our churches in Kensington, obviously. Archbishop Duncan Williams, when he was a pastor, uh, uh, before, many years ago, one of his earliest visits to Kensington Temple, he being in the church, they had a prophet or a man of God, and a man of God had this remarkable anointing. And in, right before his very eyes, the servant of God called a lady, and the lady was obese. Her size was quite enormous. And, and when, when he, called the lady, she, he called the lady forward, he said, I'm going to get you sh shrunk. And I, I was Williams, as a young pastor, I was sitting there going, how are you going to get her shrunk? <laughs> You're not going to go to the gym again. You, got, you don't have to go on a diet or anything. And he called the lady forward, and he thought there's going to be an embarrassment here. Then when the lady came forward with her dress hanging and all the rest of it, it went, angels of God, go into action. And right there at Kensington Temple, the lady just shrunk with her dress just hung. You know what he, you know what he did? He invited a man of God to Ghana. He said to his assistant, he said, we are taking this man to Ghana. How many of you want to see that man here? <laughs> that is what God can do. Amen? Amen? Some of us, as Bishop said, we see the transformation. Some people sometimes ask me, what, what is it about you? Even at Bible college, when I was doing theology, a Scottish friend of mine, He's an alien pastor now, but he's resigned and he's looking after his mom now. Um, his mom gave birth to them, two boys. And the mom is fairly old. She used to come to um, college. And one time we were revising for our exams. And he said to me, Cornelius, what is it about you? I said, tell me, John. Well, what is it about me? He said, you don't seem to have a care. I said, well, you are not married. You haven't got children. I'm a married man with two children. And if I can be so calm... Preparing for my exams. What, what is the problem with you? <laughs> he said, I don't know. Since we've been here, we were over with trouble and you don't seem to care. But I said, well, I hand everything over to God. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Let there be a difference in your place of employment. Not being hypocritical. But let the Christ you have invited into your life, let him make a difference. That is how you can attract people. Because if they are worried and you are worried, what's the difference between you and them? Amen? Amen? Even at the time that I didn't have one-tenth of what I have now, people were always wanting to borrow money from me. They thought I was a millionaire. I said to them, I'm doing something that you are not doing. I learned about tithing back in 1984 as a young man, and I will never stop. Never! Malachi 3.10 when I started teaching about giving here, some people said they've never heard about Malachi. I said, <laughs> I learned it back in 1984 when I was 20 years old. And I will never. When I was carrying Angel and Christian 
here. <laughs> because Christian was born in December, there was flu and cold everywhere. It wasn't because I just enjoyed carrying him. Yes, I enjoyed carrying him, though. But because I didn't want people to infect him with their colds and flus. <laughs> so I carried him here. And people go, oh, five pounds here, ten pounds here. I tithe over that. That's the difference. So let there be a clear difference between you and unbelievers. When they are swearing and you swear, <laughs> you can't go and witness to them. In our culture, those of you from Ghana, if you meet someone and you don't greet them, it means you've disrespected them. You can't pass them by and go, hey, I'm a Christian, I'm going to church, so you don't greet them. You cannot go back and witness to them. What does it take from you by greeting them? What does it cost you by smiling? I'm going to church. Greet them. Respect them. Buy them. Buy, listen, my Muslim neighbor, during Ramadan, he's the one that is bringing me food. At times he puts me to shame. Seriously. What do I do for him for, um, for Christmas, for Easter? Even around Christmas, he's the one that is seeking for an opportunity to bless me. Muslim Giving, yeah? There's Jewish companies that are floating when other companies are sinking. You know why? Because Jewish companies around the world, Colgate, Quaker Oats, and all these things that have survived for years, they pay their 10%. So recession has come and gone, and they are still at the top. There are principles that you and I can practice that will show us the difference between us and them. I pray that you take this word and practice it. That next week, whoever is convening, when they say who is here for the very first time, there will be several hands being lifted here. Amen. Father, we just want to thank you and bless you for your word. Timely word. Bless your servant who has spent himself to prepare and to dispense this. Father, would you bless him and his family and his ministry. Anytime we see him, anytime we hear from him or about him, May it be news worthy of your praise. Thank you for the vitality you've given him. Thank you for the longevity of ministry and life you've given him. Bless his family once again. Bless each one of us. As we leave this place, we are not leaving your presence. May your presence go with us and abide with us until we meet again. Whatever we're going to do this week, especially to please you, let your unction be upon us. In our going out and our coming in, would you orchestrate our path? Would you order our words and our steps and even the meditation of our heart? Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Folks, would you like to stand? I want to confer the benediction of God, blessing of God upon you before we go. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace now and always. Amen. Let's give a clap offering to the Lord before we go. Amen.